Willith of the, 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 the Medoxes, uh, I have a question for you. Okay. What do you call a group of divorced mutants? What? The X-Men. I think... Oh, okay, I get it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Fuck. Fuck mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Worst of Classic Who series. We are going through all of the, well, uh, some of the lower rank stories on the 2014 GWM, which was like eight years ago now, what the fuck? Um, why, they, why haven't they done another one and why haven't they put... Why is it is it because of I don't know. Anyway, um, we're doing the mutants today, which is a John Pertwee story. Um, last time we did the Space Pirates of Antonia, that was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so spoilers if you haven't watched New Who and Classic Who, because we like to talk about shit that we, we that's also not to do with this episode. So just bear that in mind. Be wary. Remember to leave a comment uh, uh, of a. New Who story for us to defend against Hellbent at the end that we usually do. Although last time it wasn't a defense, it was a versus, um, which was fun. If you go check that out, me and Antonio did Timeless Children versus Hellbent. Um, yeah. But leave a comment about that. Um, you don't need to leave a comment anymore about Classic Who stories because we, we have a finalized list, which is on the screen here, of all the ones that we're going to be watching. Uh, today's The Mutants. And we've got a, b a bunch of them that we haven't done yet. It's a whole list. And once we've gone through that, we unlock at the bottom there's Dimensions in Time. That'll be the finale of this series. I think that's all the the, 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 the prunes and hedges. I just have to say one thing. Just cracking open a cold one with the boy. <laughs> that's it. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of shit in the description that y'all can check out if you want. Uh, do you want to plug anything, Maddox? my channel i guess max yeah. productions one go check it out i'm also on Hooniversals now mm -hmm. i have been I for like a month but you know yep this morning i watched your video on uh brian was it no no not brian hales fucking mervyn Hayes and lincoln. henry lincoln god <laughs> mervyn Hayes and henry lincoln sound like <laughs> 1800s politicians <laughs> <laughs> they do a bit i'm going to my be yeti voting boys for, i'm going to be voting for mervyn Hayesman. Yes. Um, God damn it. So, I haven't seen The Mutants before. Uh, I have about, like, four times. All I know about it is that it's six parts. Some people don't like it because there's, there's, it's padded and there's lots of bad green screen. And it's considered one of the worst pearlies. But there are some people that like it and it's because it has my themes about apartheid. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you who doesn't like it. Boomers. Like, that's everyone who I've ever seen who says they dislike the mutants, they're all boomers. That's the pattern I've noticed. <laughs> like, they all watched it when it aired, and they're like, I'm never watching it again. Why? Because at the time they didn't like black people or something. <laughs> probably, I don't know. It's I don't know, I guess we'll find. That's probably the reason. Yeah. <laughs> Knowing um, boomers. Yeah, probably. Because, like, the, mu the mutants came out when apartheid was still in, like, full force. This was before Nelson Mandela came in and changed it. Hmm. I suppose so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know quite. A, I I know quite a bit about apartheid. The reason why is because, uh, in New Zealand, like we're a big fan of the sport rugby. It's because we're the best of the world at it, and so we obviously have a very strong connection with both Australia and South Africa because they're the Southern Hemisphere teams that play with us. And so because of that, um, the nineteen ninety five Rugby World Cup final was all based around like, um the people coming together after apartheid it was like south africa winning that world cup was a big moment for nelson mandela and for south africa and it was like the it was basically what signified the end of apartheid for the country and so because we were in that match with us with south africa and we lost to them and there's a whole fucking movie made out of it with matt damon and morgan freeman in it like we know quite a bit about south africa and apartheid and also i think i studied it in college as well we learned a lot about apartheid so I'm very aware of it, um, and I'm very interested to see how this story tackles it. Uh, I'm also interested to see what you described when we did the underrated stories video for the advent calendar, how you said it was a bit trippy. It is a bit in places, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, and also, I'm a, I'm a bit of an edgy contrarian. I really like six-parters. 
Um, like I, watched... I do too. I love six passes. Yeah, man. Like I watched Colony in Space the other day, and I thoroughly enjoyed it from start to finish. It was great fun. Love that it's one. a fun one, yeah. Yeah. Fucking, um, yes. Yes, I will. <laughs> I want to see the universe, not rule it. Then die. Yes. Um, Is that the line that comes after? I don't know. It's one of the lines. Probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny how they have a self-destruct lever just on the control. <laughs> um, but yeah, I story. have my DVD of the mutants. Um, yeah, it, it's... It looks like, like, the costumes look, you know, it looks a bit garish from what I can see, but I, I, I don't know, I don't mind that. I think that's kind of fun. Have have you seen Brain of Morbius? Yes, of course, I have. Okay, uh, a bit of trivia, like, that um, that, that creature at the beginning that uh, Kondo beheads is a mutant from this story. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> Interesting. Well yeah. then. And the doctor is even like, oh, that's a mutant, Sarah. <laughs> so that means that this story is is responsible for the timeless children existing because it's a prequel to the Brain of Morbius, which is a prequel to the timeless children. <laughs> which means that ap- I mean, apartheid, Colleen's... apartheid is the reason that the timeless children exist. So the the, the moral that's another the, connection. So the moral that's the, another connection. The moral of the story is oh, a, is that racism is bad because it means we get bad television. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Colony in Space also has a connection to uh, the Timeless Children because it has that guy who's like the adjudicator, and they use the same photo for him as a Morbius Doctor. I can't remember who the guy's name is. Oh, the actual but, adjudicator, yeah. not. So hang on a second. Yeah, the actual, not not the master. No. <laughs> wait, wait. So <laughs> the, the fake adjudicator was the master, and the real one was the Doctor. <laughs> It's fucking hilarious. <laughs> Fuck Chris Chibnall. Anyway. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> fucking boring old man. Oh, the, the, the doctor's at his best when he's running down corridors and putting out fires. Uh, the, yeah, fam, that's, that's, the, that's the, the fam of blood. <laughs> Alright, before, before this hits the ten minutes, I think... Before this hits ten minutes, we should probably start the story because it's a six-part. Yeah, enough of the witty banter. <laughs> yeah, let's chuck on the mutants. I hope <laughs> I hope it's one of the ones where it has all six parts on one disc. Because if it doesn't, I'm gonna murder a small child. Oh, it is. It is. Yeah. I always thought this Pertwee face was a puppet. <laughs> Hello, Joe. Bring it here. I'm fucking autumn. <laughs> For heaven's sake, <laughs> respect your superiors. The heavens take me then. Let me leave this fucking planet. Oh yeah, this is directed by Chris Barry. That makes me very happy. Ah. What else did he do? Um, he did the Daleks and Power of the Daleks, and um, ah. um, Creature from the Pit, and the Demons, and many okay. other great stories. Why is Pertwee so comforting? But yeah, this is my favourite way of getting the Time Lords involved with a plot. Like, you don't see them, they just send the Doctor on a mission. Mm. It gives them off-screen shadowy motives. I love the twist at the end of Curse of Peladon when they find out that it was actually the Time Lords. That's a great way of doing it. Yeah, that's great too. Need me to look after Sorry, Joe. You want to rubbish, not this time. Au revoir. Oh no, you don't! <laughs> I love this music. <laughs> I love Joe's confidence by this point. Because season eight, she's like, I know that's the point of Joe. Like, she's yeah. gaining confidence, but like, you know, at this point, it's really oh. satisfying that she doesn't take yeah. a shit. Oh, yeah. I love this direction. Chris Barry is amazing. Isn't that slang for the arse? Maybe. The tradesman entrance. <laughs> I thought you were going to say the red carpet. (laughs) So we've already set up like three factions. Yeah. I always love that thing in Classic Who when they just karate chop someone and that knocks them unconscious. (laughs) Me and Hugh call it the sci-fi chop. It's like, oh no, the sci-fi chop. (laughs) (laughs) 
That's funny. <laughs> oh, I love Joe Grant. <laughs> Same. Imagine if he were that guy from Aliens of London. Mm. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are at war. <laughs> He'd just be like, the mutants should be naked. <laughs> Ooh, oh, like... space chess. Wow. Always a bit dodgy in chess that white moves first. Oh, damn. Yes, Joe, it's going to be one of those stories. Hmm. One of those politically charged ones. But heavens, man, we're not at war with the Salonians. We're giving them independence. Oh, eventually. Oh. Oh. <laughs> yep. This is definitely an apartheid allegory. Maybe that's why boomers don't like this story, because mm. too political. It's like 1970s bull tricks. <laughs> what the 1970s version of Mr. Dinkles look like, though? <laughs> Professor Dinkles. Yeah, they're only giving them independence because they can't afford an empire anymore. Mm-hmm. Damn. The plant is a shithole, Joe. <laughs> of course this man wants to see what's in it. You sh- You shan't hide anything from me, I am superior. <laughs> oh, that ball said gay rights when it was shot. Because <laughs> it was flashing all the colours yeah. of the rainbow. Hugh pointed this out when we were marathoning Classic Who. How often the doctor's accused of being like a spy or a saboteur or some shit. Yeah. It was just like, it's just a natural thing that happens. It's like, well, how the hell did you get here? <laughs> yeah. Obviously a spy. That's something we noticed in um the Space Pirates is like, it's literally impossible for anyone to get that deep in space. It's like, how the hell do they do it? That's why people were so confused when they saw him. Tense conversation. Music. <laughs> Pertwee always does that with his fingers. Like, brushes his chin. It's like when Troughton, like, grabs his ring finger. Or pinky finger. Oh, yeah. Or, like, when Tennant rubs the back of his head. Segregation, wow. <laughs> this would really strike a chord. The box is opening. Wait, this is for you. <laughs> oh. Ooh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh my. All right. So, um, that was pretty great, honestly. Yeah. Uh, the only not the... much happened. Not well, much we... happened, but well, like um, it was a very slow burn. Well, it was it was all just setting up the the story, and I thought it did it excellently. Like the writing was all very good. The only thing that I didn't like was the yeah. set. The set just looks bland. But apart from that, like the performances, the the writing, like all of the stuff that's setting up is fit fucking really good. <laughs> oh, yeah. And your problem with the sets will change because they beam down to the surface of Solos in the mm. next episode. Yeah, oh so, yeah, um... the, the, the shots <clears throat> that they showed on the surface were great. Uh, and the shots that they showed of them looking out the window at the surface was great. It's just the set of the spaceship was a bit, like, it just looks dry. But the um, the actual story itself, fucking really good. Uh, and there's some really funny moments as well. But I love the whole thing of, yeah. like, there's this box that can't open until the right person opens it, and like obviously the overlords are like so angry that they can't open it. It's like, why the fuck am I not allowed to see this? But then, of course, when one of the um, I don't know what they're called, but the people that are like under them opens it, it starts to open. You know. Yeah, the so solons. It. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yes, this is. I can see why this is an apartheid allegory because Jesus Christ, it has everything. <laughs> the only the only thing it doesn't have is race, but I think that's kind of the point of the story is it's trying to show you 
apartheid in a different sense. It's like if it was done, but not by race, but by like, I don't know, what, like what would you call it? Like a <sighs> species, species, I suppose, or like the, the kind of yeah. kind of group of people they are. Um, yeah, and I the the way that they had that that whole scene where the overlord was making his speech, and then the person under him was like saying things in response to him is very it's very allegoric of apartheid where it's like the 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 overlords which in case of apartheid was like the white people are like oh we're gonna give you independence you'll be able to live by yourself but like the thing is that's that's like that's a load of shit because just because you give black people independence doesn't mean their quality of life is going to be equal because you own all the resources all the all the money all the royal all the royalty of like of the country all the diamonds everything and so whilst they may be independent they're not going to have any they're not going to have any um quality of life to live on and also because they're going to be segregated there's going to be tension and it's just yeah i think i i really i i, I this is bring this is bringing me back to like years ago when i used to watch documentaries about apartheid and talk with my dad about it it's it's really interesting to me i can see why someone else might not give a shit about it but i think it's really cool so yeah that was a for me that was an excellent part one so far yeah and you've got um because you've got the marshal who's just like no they must be wiped out and then you've got the other mm. guy who was just like no they're gonna have independence whether they're ready for it or not so it's like oh <laughs> like mm. neither of you are giving a shit yeah they're, they're like two different extremes of like fascism yeah and it's always just fun to watch like the third doctor and joe just exist in a in a plot <laughs> yeah it's like it's like well yeah exactly but like but what you were saying before about those two characters is like one of them just wants to get rid of them and have it over and done with and the other one like wants to let them live in suffering it's like which one's worse <laughs> yeah especially and especially this all works so well because it's established that the planet they live on is a pile of shit you know it's all just gray oh um, I don't know if you want to save this for the end, it's technically trivia, but like, did you know this was originally submitted as a Troughton story? Oh, really? Yeah, Barry Letts originally submitted this as a, The Mutant. Okay. <laughs> and then, and then when he finally became producer, um, he was like, okay, I want this concept to actually go ahead now, and then he commissioned Bob Baker and Dave Martin to do it. And I okay. think they did it pretty well. Okay. This is one of their better um... scripts. Well, I mean, I've only seen part one, so we'll see where it goes. But um, of course, I'm I'm kind of happy that Bob Baker and Dave Martin did it because I just find like I watched the demons the other day, and like it's a good story, but I just find Barry Letts' writing to be a bit like <laughs> it's a bit cheesy. Like he's a, he's a, he's such yeah. a Barry Letts is such the kind of person where he's like Doctor Who is a show for children, you know? That's I get that vibe off him, and that's why you got stuff like <laughs> the third Doctor waking up and going Eureka. And then fucking, like, like you got the really cheesy bit at the end where the demon wants to kill the doctor, and Joe's like, "No, take me." Oh yeah, yeah. Um, Destroyed by love. Yeah, except oh, they were, they were but I, but I kind of love how um, I think it's in World War Three. Russell T Davies like takes the piss out of this and has Harriet Jones do it, but it's really funny. <laughs> no, take me first. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, love Russell. Yeah, love the uh, story too. Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm looking forward to part two now. I just I'm I'm really liking the story so far, and I'm 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 hoping that we we see another setting soon. That's the only thing is is I just want to see a more like a more like sexy background to go with the story, you know. Yeah, they beam down to the planet, and things get a little psychedelic later yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. Although I, like I will, I will say there is man. there was this little like logo on the wall. Um, that looked like the album cover cover of the color and the shape, so I thought that was cool because it was recognizable. And obviously, they also had that font that's used in like the tenth planet and you know and all that. Oh, actually, now hang on. Yeah. Is it the tenth planet? Or is it the War Machines? I think it's the War Machines that uses it. It's used. It's used in the War Machines, and it's also used in a lot of just set design of other classic Who stories. Like it's in the mm. Invisible Enemy. That's the one I remember most clearly. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm also I'm I'm also using that font for a video I'm making. <laughs> um, that's coming out in December. Wink, wink. I. I see. <laughs> I 
I will stay tuned. Unless I'm involved, in which case. <laughs> no, you're not involved. It's just me. Okay. Um, right, okay. <laughs> I love that transition where his face goes green. Yeah, and then the weird bloody like vortex thing like mm. spreads out into the logo. Yeah, it's got like 50 blur on it. I love how it was a hostage situation when they were up on the base, and now they're just having a conversation. <laughs> Maybe this elevator, like, removes all assault. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what terrible aim! <laughs> he had seconds to figure that out. Because I am the marshal. Show me your ball, doctor. Oh, yeah, the chin stroke. I feel naked unless I'm in a laboratory. The girl must not be harmed. That's better. <laughs> oh, here we go. This reminds me of um, fucking Phantom Menace when they're walking through the, like the misty jungle, like the Gungans are getting ready to fight. <laughs> Misa choking on gas. Oh yeah, it's not a Doctor Who story unless the companion uh, gets their perfectly good outfit, like completely muddy, mm -hmm. like Martha and the Doctor's daughter. Yeah. Or maybe the Doctor Who writers just have a fetish. Just Jody. Yes, Jody, Jody gets Jody gets soaked in the witch finders. <laughs> just like yes, every woman must smother themselves in mud and dirt and water and. Rose and New Earth gets a shower. <laughs> oh, I like this room. Something of the sort. Now tell me, Doctor, what the blaze is going on in here? Oh, Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, still in masks. Great idea. Works perfectly. Oh. Oh, now I hate him. <laughs> It's so odd seeing like savage, like sort of tribal people on a ship like this. Yeah, it's like two stories crossing over. Ooh, Persuade in shirt sleeves. Oh. Doctor always looks naked without a jacket on. I think you'll find that. But that should hold the proton beam steady. <laughs> <laughs> this is this such a delay? I think you'll find that 10 second shot of plugging in wires. Is this like their kind of CPR? I guess so. Sexy alien CPR. I love those future Earth predictions. Mm. This, I think the this, first one is in the sensor rights. This, this kind of oh, contradicts the Ice Warriors, doesn't it? <laughs> I did not know. I'm surrounded by oh. incompetence, sir. Okay, that's a bit dodgy. Yeah, a bit. <sighs> the story is anti-racism, but the only black character is called Cotton. Uh... <laughs> I've already got the cotton. Hmm. It's in hospital. Answers. Uh... Right? I suppose... I suppose... That might not be his, like, birth name. That might just be what they called him. Like, the racist people would have well, called him that. But it's still a bit, like, well, on the nose. We'll give, it, we'll give them a they tried sticker. Because mm. <laughs> you did hear him, he just say, oh, we have another cotton in, was it in hospital or something? I, I didn't hear. Yeah. We I think, too busy I think going, it's just, oh. this is what these people call, you know, people of colour, I suppose. <laughs> oh god, yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it's slipping. <laughs> no! Oh. They tried. Maybe he changed his mind, Mmm. See, there's, there's like racism even within the overlords themselves. It's just, there's just so many layers of it. Like, this guy is meant to be one of the privileged class, and yet he's still treated like shit. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking yeet. <laughs> oh my 
my god. Yeah, it's alright. It's not bad. Not a bad cliffhanger. Yeah, it's not bad. It's just it's, I don't know. It's it's better than some some of the ones I've seen. Yeah. Um. Okay. So that one was very like, what well, what's the word for it? It's not transitional, but it was definitely um. Again, it, funnily enough, um. Uh, what was I gonna say? The fucking. Like the chess game they were playing, this is like moving all the chess pieces around. Yeah. Um, we learned quite a bit about like the caves, and we got a bit about the surface uh, with Joe and I think Kai. It's what's the character's name? Is it Kai or is it another one? Can't Kai remember. is the one that Joe is with. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then of course we, um, the Doctor tried to open up the the box with that machine. And he learns about, <laughs> oh, genocide is a side effect. For heaven's sake, man. Like that sort of thing. Um, and there is a person of colour called Cotton, and that's really awkward. Yeah. Mm. And it's kind of, pl- it's try- they're trying to play it as there is racism even within the Overlord's own society. But it's just, <laughs> I don't know if that was necessary, <laughs> to be honest. Hmm. Classic Who's, even Doctor Who in general's like depiction of race gets better and better with each Doctor's era, so... Well, okay, except for Jodie. Yeah. We don't it, talk about that. <laughs> it gets better and better with, with each era, so we can sort of take solstice in the fact that... Well, I mean, some people some people would since. disagree with you on that, with, with, you know, stories like The Shakespeare Code and Thin Ice. Some people would definitely disagree with you on that. Um, it's certainly contentious yeah. all the way through. Yeah, I suppose. Um, but it's like, I think their heart's in the right place, but the, just the execution is just too... You just, you didn't have, you didn't have to call him that. <laughs> you could have done something else. I think yeah. that was yeah. me. <laughs> and the thing is, it's not like, it's not like that that wouldn't happen. It's just... It's not needed. That's the thing for me. I don't think it's needed to do that. But that's like the only real massive issue I'm having with the story so far. It's just just that one detail is a bit too far. Apart from that, I actually think Cotton's a good character. Like the character behind it is a good character. I like the way how he's almost trying to help the Doctor and he's trying to like he's trying to sabotage the Overlords a bit, which I really liked because they're obviously treating him like What's shit. The... Oh well, it doesn't fix conflict then. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, only, oh, only when it's a man and a woman. There we go. Oh yeah. The teleporter is homophobic. Oh, Pertwee getting forceful. Oh, I feel now, so, I feel I, sad for it now. Oh. I always ask myself with like every Doctor Who monster, would I fuck it? <laughs> And with the mutants, probably yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> That's a spoiler for you. <laughs> God, for someone who is not a Moffat fan, you certainly like. You're certainly horny, and you certainly like spoilers. Uh, I see myself in the Moffat era clearly. <laughs> Such creatures are evil, you see. Ooh. Ooh. So there's dissension between Ooh. the lower people as well. God, this, this, uh, like, this story has so many, like, layers of bigotry. Yeah. At every level. It's like you've got, like, white supremacist overlords. And then you got like non-white supremacist overlords, and then you got like coloured overlords, and then you got like the under people that don't like the mutants, and then you got the under people that do like the mutants, and then you got the mutants themselves. Yeah. Very layered. <laughs> they got thick bums. Not quite. Honestly, this is actually quite like almost sad. I actually, I, I almost feel like emotional thinking that these are real people. They've been reduced to this by oppression. 
Ooh. Oh, I love this scene. Ooh. <laughs> ah, <laughs> now I see it. Boy. Doctor, the LSD is a bit strong. <laughs> it's the 70s, man. <laughs> Why isn't this a Tom Baker story? <laughs> Ah, Leela. <laughs> so look, Joe walked into a ravey cave, fainted, and then some astronaut came along and picked This is up. actually a scene where, like, bad green screen actually works. Yeah. Another long pause for Pertwee to explain something. Patience, my friend. This is six episodes long. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta fill them out somehow. Not to say there's not enough su substance to justify, because oh damn there is. Mm. I dare say that's the case with most six parters. Exactly. Like people, people like give six parters so much crap. Of course, in some cases it's deserved. Let's not like talk about the that. Web planet. <laughs> <laughs> I like the web planet. And and the certain other one that you were way too positive on last time, but let's not talk about that. <laughs> yeah, if you were paying atten attention to the background of the caves earlier, you would have seen, like, mm. some of the drawings on the walls. See that one in the corner. I'm getting flashbacks to Game of Thrones, and it's, I'm not happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, these were our people. not a Pertwee story unless he goes, no! Stay! No! <laughs> For heaven's sake, man! I love Pertwee's outfit in this story. Not a fan of the necktie, but everything else is... Dope. Oh no, oh no, I think the necktie makes it special. Valid. Oh, don't ruin the map! No, I want to colour... No! Yeah, I want to colour it in. He's scribbled on the map. It looks amazing. But yeah, I do want to colour in. <laughs> colour it in like these colours. Yeah. How? <laughs> <laughs> How did you not see him? Are you fucking blind? <laughs> Didn't know they had Instagram in 1972. Hashtag new filter, Joe. Mm, this is... It's a bit like um the the primitives from Colony in Space. They're like, you need to stay out of our forbidden land. Or it's more like, the city is forbidden. Oh, I like how he's like part mutated. Yeah, with some sexy prosthetics. Oh, oh. there's more shit gone. Oh, that spine makes me tingle. Makes me shiver. Ugh. Hello? Hello? <laughs> hey, what's going on around here? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and the stops. Hey, what's going on around here? Your body's full of poison. You're gonna burn. <laughs> no. Oh no. I always love his delivery there, like, no! It's like grayscale. Oh. So they're high. Oh no, the caves are getting hotboxed. Oh no! Well, we're halfway through the story already. Yeah. I love how long that theme tune screeches in the seventies, <laughs> like. Yeah, it go yeah, it goes all the way. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I, again, like, we're halfway through the story already, and I'm enjoying it. There's a lot going on. There's a lot, like we said, there's lots of layers to the uh, apartheid allegory. There's obviously, I think it's safe to say that um, the main villain, what's his name again? The. The Marshal. The Marshal, yeah. He's certainly like. 
someone would, would say he's almost a bit one-dimensional, but that is reflective of what some people are like in real life, so I think it's accurate. It's an yeah. accurate portrayal of like how you know boneheaded and cardboard racism can be. Um, and there's also some very trippy visuals, and I... It's funny, because when I saw the posters for the story, like, years ago, I was like, oh, is this going to be one where, like, the mutants are, like, the scary ones, right? But actually, no. The mutants are more like... It's more like... It's more like sad sympathy that I feel for them. The fact that they've they've been reduced to this. And they, they look so grotesque, and they, they're in, obviously in pain, because when we saw the human ones grow mutant, like, almost grayscale on their skin, they feel pain. Like, he, the guy couldn't even lift his sword out. So imagine if your entire body was just that, you'd just be constantly in pain. Like, that's really quite sad. And it's all happened because of this, you know, uh, this, this big fuck-up that's happened because of all the, you know, the planet being turned to waste and the sort of the segregation and all that. It's really interesting stuff. Um... I can see why someone in the 70s might think it's heavy-handed, but, like, I think it's really, really well-written so far. Apart from, apart from the cotton bit, but everything else has been pretty good. Splendid. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to, I'm looking forward to the second half, what can I say? <laughs> I'm keeping my big mouth shut because I know I'll just blabber something, so... <laughs> well, I mean, you can talk, just don't spoil anything. <laughs> Mutants, good, good story. I second everything you say. Yes. Now that... Ow, I bite my hand. <laughs> yes, that's your punishment for spoiling. <laughs> um, it's it's a, it's a little bit like you know it's a little bit slow, but I don't mind that. I I'm I know that me and you are like we're the kind of people where we kind of just we enjoy like being able to sit and enjoy the padding, you know. Yeah, I love padding. Padding is sexy. It's it's not that padding is necessarily good for storytelling. It's just when when you get those extra bonus scenes that reveal like small details that add on top of the story. It's it's a little bit of world building. It's also just lets you get it, it lets you just sit in the atmosphere of the story and just really s let it sink in. If you know what I mean? Yeah, because like I recently watched a few McCoy stories, and I like I like the McCoy era enough, but like some of those stories are so compact and yeah, like, like no Ghost, Ghost Light deleted. Go, I think Ghost Light is a specific example because it's three parts. Yeah, and something like even the Happiness Patrol. I love the Happiness Patrol, but like mm. it's only three parts, and I just want more world building out of that. And seeing the deleted scenes like really helps to flesh out the story some more. And I'm glad that I can come to like. Troughton era, Pertwee era, Hartman era stories where we can just relish in that atmosphere. Yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't feel too long to me. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've never like I don't even know if I've ever really felt like a story has been too long. It's just sometimes they're just shit. Like Invasion of Time is shit, not because it's six parts, but because it's just shit. <laughs> just because yeah. it's just because it's yeah, a shit that. story. <laughs> it being six episodes is not the problem. The problem is the, just what's in it. Yeah, yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah, um, but yeah, I'm I'm really enjoying this so far. It's it's not like a masterpiece or anything, but it's it's a really I think this is a really solid story with some really good direction, really you know, some really good themes. And um, I think yeah, I think the Pertwee era because the Pertwee era was obviously being very very restrained with its off-world adventures around this time and i think they were making like good choices for what stories to mm. actually go off-world for oh yeah well curse of peladon is just the perfect example of how to do it i love love yeah. absolutely <laughs> froth over that story oh beautiful yeah it wasn't just haha we're taking a break from unit let's just do dumb space shit it's like no mm. we're gonna be serious pol politics in space yeah, I suppose I suppose the first the first one that isn't like politics and space is Carnival of Monsters, but that's Robert Holmes doing really creative shit with his you know story, so oh, yeah. it works. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, yeah, this this has been really good so far. Um, certainly not as bad as the reputation lets it out to be, I don't think. Yeah, I but, agree. Um, 
But uh, we'll see. We'll see if it goes south in the second half because that does happen sometimes. Like um, I think I, I think the first one we did in this series was the Leisure Hive, and the first half of the story we're like, you know, this is a bit like bollocks, but it's kind of like chaotically enjoyable. And then we got the second half, and it was just, oh boy, <laughs> oh boy, the second half of the Leisure Hive is a fever dream. Yeah. <sighs> Ludicrous story. Oh, oh yeah, hello there. The astronaut guy. This reminds me of the end of Spy Kids 3 when fucking Frodo comes in and he's like, I'm the guy. It looks like an idle animation from a video game. <laughs> Just like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> mm. When I was a, in my early teens, I used to go to church and that's like what they would do when they'd be like, tell your friends to come to church. And they'd do that, that like idle animation. <laughs> But part of the reason why I don't like the Chris Chibnall dialogue is because it reminds me of like the forced preachiness of church. <laughs> anyway, I can see that one, anyway, so, yeah. that's enough of it. That's enough of that nonsense. That's enough of Jesus. <laughs> yes, yeah, so although we're in the studio. Again. Although when Russell does Jesus in the show, it's actually good. <laughs> I forgive you. Just in case if you remembered that line from last week where you mentioned a missing professor or whatever. <laughs> I am surprised by how well a lot of classic who stories flow together when you're watching them like mm. as one huge bulk. Yeah. That's not how they're intended. Think with this... That's not how they're intended to be viewed. Yeah. Yeah, you'd think in a serialized format it would be like a very stop and go momentum and it'd be pretty awkward, mm. but like they flow surprisingly well most of the time. So when you watch them as like omnibus. I love this man's like necklaces. Whatever they are. Yeah, beads. Pen and shit. Pendants. Oh, anal beads. <laughs> 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 I pleasure the mutants with these anal beads. Don't threaten me with a good time. What? <laughs> Is this guy actually South African? I've been here ever since. Don't know. Maybe. Well, he's either that or he's like some kind of European. As you see, I lack equipment. Probably, yeah. Maybe like German or Dutch. He might he might be Dutch because South Africans have a Dutch accent. Hmm. It's like a mix of like Dutch and African. Pertwee's hair has an odd texture to it this story. Yeah. I think it's just been cut. It's more combed. It's not really as chaotically floofy as mm. per usual. Here we go. Unboxing video. <laughs> Hello, I am uh, John Pertwee. <laughs> Here's for what's in my parcel. <laughs> I have a DVD of The Claws of Axel. <laughs> <laughs> I love how this man has such a fat torso but then skinny legs. Oh, he's doing the chin thing again. Oh yeah, these these shots are strange. I don't know why they're like this. Yeah, why is it warped? I don't know. I've never understood. I'm curious as to how many scenarios there are like this in Doctor Who. Just the, I'm staying behind. No, Doctor, you can't! Take her with you. No, Doctor! No, Joe, I must find out. <laughs> Be all right, Joe. I love this direction. Life in some form will always go on. Let's hope so. <laughs> clever, clever dialogue. Oh, Oops. the sci-fi chop again. <laughs> <laughs> All side characters are made of glass, in a way. For heaven's sake. Eureka, it's a calendar. Yeah, Eureka! Any man, perhaps. <laughs> I'm special. I'm awesome. Or I'm a lady. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, Pertwee is the most fabulous lady I've ever seen. Even if Pertwee was a lady, he'd still be a top. Oh, yeah. 
How do we move? I love this man's costume. That way, this way. So blue. Yeah, it's such a weird aesthetic, like a cave, and then there's this astronaut guy in it. Mm. It's not quite an astronaut costume, but you know what I mean. Radiation. I, I, I just love his like blue metallic costume. Oh, this is like. So you know how, like, in Smith and Jones, the Tenth Doctor gets subjected to radiation but is fine, but then in the end of time he dies from radiation? Yeah. This is like that. In in this story, the Third Doctor gets subjected to radiation and is fine, but then he dies from it in Planet of the Spiders. Yeah. <laughs> it's different it's different kinds of radiation, though. That's, that's made very clear. Yeah, and also, different, yeah, and also different, different extremes as well. True that, like, but you know, like the one in Smith and Jones is like about. a, it's like a X-ray radiation, whereas the one in End of Time is like, it's like an entire fucking, uh, vacuum room or whatever it's called. Yeah. And this is just some trippy cave, <laughs> while Planet of the Spiders is like crystals or some shit. God, this story's flying by. Yeah. This is really good. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what else to say. It's really good. <laughs> Whoa. Trippy shit. Underworld wishes it was this. <laughs> I haven't seen Underworld yet. Well, it's got similar, similarly crappy green screen, but like, not really any of the imagination. <laughs> Well, Antonio likes it, so we'll see what happens. This looks like one of my nightmares. Like, imagine like a thousand bees running towards you and you, you can't like move fast, you have to move slowly. Yeah, like the chroma key outline works here because it's like it's like light bouncing off his body. Do you ever just look at a prop and think, man, I wonder where that is today? Because mm. I'm thinking that about that statue thing. <laughs> Fireman's carry. They always show the booty to the camera. I actually forgot the sky base was even a thing because we spent so long on the surface of mm. the planet. It's great. <laughs> oh, here we go. Oh, yeah. Now we're back on the stupid sky base. Who do you think they are? It's too late. I investigate what? Your activity. <laughs> <laughs> you're so blind, man. You don't know what you're doing. <laughs> If this was a season 8 string, the investigator would be the master. Oh yeah. The master's currently taking a nap between the sea devils and the time monster. Without masks oh, all. The marsh Yeah, the marshal says anti-mask. Oh, the sci-fi chop again. Maybe the gas has caused their like nervous system to like um pulsate or something like enlarge. Now thanks to the marshal. Threatened with extinction. Oh, it's, it's not a sickness. No, it's a metamorphosis. Mm. Mm. Adaptive change. The mutants as we know them are an intermediate form. Oh my god, this is amazing. <laughs> I was waiting for you to find that bit out. So yeah, what a twist. Yeah, that was great. It's it's a natural evolution and it's being halted by bigotry. Oh, a tilted camera. Whenever I see tilted cameras, I either think of the first Thor film or I think of the Idiot's Lantern. You see, Detective Inspector Bishop, how do you know my name? It's written on your collar. <laughs> Bless you, man. <laughs> Can't believe we're quoting your least favourite tenant story. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> hell. Although, although anyway, I can... Back to good I can... I can imagine John Pertwee making the bike, the motorcycles Elvis scene make, like actually being cool. <laughs> <laughs> you got my way, doll. You go my way, my dear chap. <laughs> That's how he'd say. <laughs> <laughs> he'd say it to like the brigadier, and he's just like, "I am not getting on the back of that bike with you." <laughs> anyway, back to good Doctor Who. <laughs> hmm. 
Russell's Bay, but that story ain't it. Oh, he didn't write it's fucking it. Mark Gatiss. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, the green screen is quite bad. Whoa! At this <laughs> See, this is what I wanted to happen in the Saranga conundrum. Oh my god, it's Katarina. <laughs> oh hell yeah, they used a stock footage from, like, NASA. No, we must wait for the Holy One. Oh my god, it's Monkey Chain. That's, that's great. Oh my god. So, that might be the best one yet. Best episode, best episode of the best... Mutants. Oh, okay, I thought you meant best cliffhanger. <laughs> no, 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 God, no. Uh, what I mean is, is that might be the best, like, part four might be the best one so far. Yeah, because the twist. Yeah, the twist. The extra layers. That was fantastic, the fact that the mutation is actually naturally part of the evolution, and it takes place over, like, 500 years through um, weather patterns, and it's being fucked up by fascism and racism and all that good stuff. This story has so many layers, it's yep. delicious. Yeah, it's it's like Shrek. <laughs> yes. All good as have layers. Yeah. Kai should have been Shrek. That's that's the only yes. solution. Yeah, but no, this is a this has been a really good story so far. <laughs> like, holy shit. <laughs> What's, why do people not like the mutants? <laughs> because everyone else is a boomer. That's the only answer. <laughs> everyone else is a fucking racist. That's why they feel oh, yeah. they feel attacked by this episode. Yeah, but it's like that meme. It's like I'm in this image and I don't like it. That's how they feel about the mutants. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Word of advice for people that I watch six parters at home. Um, after each episode go for like a walk around the block and then fill up your glass of water and drink it during the episode it actually helps a lot because it like you i mean i don't know if everyone's like this but when i go for a walk around the block it like reshuffles my brain and i start thinking about what i just watched and it like lets it really sit in and then i come back to the next episode and i'm ready i ju i just chaotically binge the fucker <laughs> yeah i do that as well but I, I i also find that that can help sometimes yeah, um, especially because I live. For... Especially because of the um the country that I live in, is so nice outside. Oh, yeah. Take me there. <laughs> yes. If I was if oh, I was um if I was Doctor Who showrunner um and I wanted to do a political story, I could probably, I could do one like sort of similar to the mutants, but do it about the dawn raids, which is like a New Zealand thing. I'd be interested to pick um, that. I think it was like in the 70s or 80s, it was a thing where um, police would go into factories where Pacific Island people would work and they would raid them and send them back to the island. Uh, and the, um, hmm. the excuse the police had was like, oh yes, you've overstayed your welcome, except a lot of the time that wasn't true. But yeah, like uh, it would be interesting. And also because it's, because the Dawn Raids takes place like in real life takes place over like multiple countries because you got like the islands and then you've also got new zealand i could make it a story that goes to different locations you know but you know <laughs> i've got a bunch of doctor who ideas on my mind that i want to i could make into stories so maybe i could like make it like a little series of stories and, like release them week yeah, by week because i've already i've already got one um series. i've already got a couple of other ideas that i'm uh, that i've already got noted down like i've got one for like a, a fifth doctor story about nostalgia like a nostalgia drug that rules a society, and then I've also got one like a historical in ancient Egypt with the Ninth Doctor in mind. Yeah, I could make a little series of stories. Sleep. I think this is Bob Baker and Dave Martin's best script. Um, that might be controversial to say. I'll, I'll wait till the end till I make a judgment on that. But um, I recently rewatched the Claws of Axos, and I completely changed my mind on that one. So, I still don't. I still think it's black. I used. And to... I just watched it like. A month ago, the, so. the first time I watched it, I thought it was Blair, and then I I like read Lord Slar's opinions on it, and then I rewatched it, and I thought, oh yes, now it's good. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I was about to say Lord Slar is is coercing you, but then again, you've coerced me about Tenant, so mm -hmm. this is a bombing. This guy looks like a living salmon. Oh, Pertwee's hair was floofier there. Mm. 
Oh, I love bullshit space physics. Like, they should all just be gone at this point. It's nah, so it's so refreshing. It's, it's so refreshing to hear different accents in this show. But yeah, the bullshit space physics of like how they could just a slight suction and they can stumble out the room with it. I think <laughs> when it's, in reality it, they'd I, all just. I think it's artificial gravity. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. They probably should have said though in like part one. <laughs> Pertwee always looks like he has the sun in his eyes. <laughs> For heaven's sake. Such a pity. This grant had nothing to do with it. <laughs> I'm just gonna kill you because I'm a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> Woman, it's a shame to kill her. <laughs> Although you know, if this story had Perry in it, it would have him sexualize her. Mm. A shame to kill you. <laughs> Oh, I just realised that it says SB on the Marshal's chest. At first I thought it said, like, 58, and I was <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I also love that globe. I have it, but it's of the moon. Well, that's obviously been customised to look like a different planet. Damn, Joe. You go, girl. <laughs> that was like ten minutes of Marshall. You are fucked for a million reasons. <laughs> no, I will win because racism. <laughs> I always love when poetry mutters like a confirmation quietly. Just mm -hmm. yes, well, yes, all right. <laughs> Very well then. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I also love that ambient sound effect. Mm. It's used um, quite a lot in the '60s, actually. I know. I keep. I know. Like, I keep, especially when they. I know. I keep saying it, but Chris Barry's direction is just superb. He makes Doctor Who look like a film. I don't think about this often, but I'm wondering what like these scenes would look like in sixteen by nine. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> I love this. <laughs> <laughs> we I love, love our I, cheeky get third doctor. I love his like his dry dad humor, where he's just like he doesn't even <laughs> cheekily smile when he says goodbye. He's just like goodbye. <laughs> Love me some corridors. Oh hell yeah! <laughs> Freeze Joe first. You just know if Jamie were here first, he'd go over him rather than the female companion. <laughs> Best bit about the space pirates. <laughs> oh, the sonic screwdriver. Slimy knob. What a knob. Yeah. God, Pertwee knows how to strike a pose. Just the way he stood in that door. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and the chin stroke again. <laughs> We're going to bullshit our way to fix the problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's a partner line. I always love it when Tom Baker does previous doctors in his voice. Like he does like little moments. Like yeah. some sometimes he goes, hmm. No, oh, the old weary guard who turns his back to the prisoners trope. <laughs> <laughs> Must have the sorry screwdriver. <laughs> No! Starts! It's <laughs> Stopsy! Fuck! Chris Barry's so good! I know, that God. shot was. Mm. God! He makes this horrible set look like a million dollars. Everything's just so dynamic. 
I this, know. This is what Warriors of the Deep was missing. I also really loved Katie Manning's voice when she was like, um, doing that thing on the communicator. A lot of discipline for her not to look right down the lens as well. <laughs> oh, that's satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> That's me to this story. That's <laughs> me <laughs> fully just a. <clears throat> Antimatter. That's a bit of foreshadowing. Undoing un things untogether. <laughs> Why is the dialogue so good? Because it's a good story. <laughs> yeah. Yay! Our heroes have Sci -fi chop. The mutation rate can be made to go as it was meant to. But you must help. You must help me find the doctor. You come with me and find him. This is fucking inspiring, man. <laughs> this is like Braveheart stuff right here. I like that curly cord. <laughs> You're giving all the insightful commentary on apartheid, and I'm just here like, yeah, cord, nice. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a sippy straw. I'm really looking forward to what happens now. This 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 has been such a good build up. <laughs> it's not as good as the one from um, the space pirates where the ship sexually enters the thing. <laughs> <sighs> Bloody hell. Anyway. Oh. We'll all be done oh, no. for. A thing, a thing will happen. <laughs> Tune in <laughs> next week. That was that was very Chris Chibnall, to be honest. We're all gonna be yeah. done for. <laughs> okay. Very so. Very good episode. We've only got one left. This is fucking very good. The marshal's like, being backed into a corner, but he's got one last trick up his sleeve. Like, uh, I'm waiting for the story to go shit, and it's just getting better and better. <laughs> I dare say it doesn't go shit. It gets weird, but it doesn't go shit. <laughs> yeah. We've only got one more episode, and it's it's already, like... This, this is a very good story. Like, really good story. It'll be interesting to tell how far this will rate among the other worst of Classic Who... We'll You've see. done so far. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah. It all it all rides on this final episode. Let us begin. Right. Unless you want to keep talking about part five, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, no. It'll be fine. I just want to get into it, to be honest. Docking again. <laughs> oh, hello. No there. tense music that time. Oh, like just smack the table. <laughs> <laughs> these look like <laughs> these look like pound shop time lords yes people fought against your bullshit no surprise mutant natives as a local term mm. sounds like a racial slur yeah I am yet qualified in <laughs> certainly wouldn't want the marshal breathing on my ear <laughs> Say the right thing, Doctor. Chris Barry just knows how to rotate a camera. Oh. Me when I watch the mutants. <laughs> <laughs> Get inside. Oh. <laughs> oh, this is definitely me when I watch the mutants. <laughs> whisper, 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 mumble. I think um, a lot of this could just be fixed on the Blu-ray. True. <laughs> the most brutal and callous series of crimes against the defenseless people it's ever been my misfortune to encounter. Shit's going down. Hell Ooh. yeah, I totally want the mutants to huddle after me. <laughs> <laughs> I just love how like shivery they are. They're just scared of everything. The normie thing is to simp for the attractive companion, but my thing is to just simp for 
the creatures. <laughs> the mutants, much the disease, can be wiped off the face of the planet. I'm... <laughs> Oh, that's so satisfying. One of them's gonna be the delegate for the mutants. Oh, It was scared! Oh god, imagine Eccleston against this guy. Oh my god, he would tear his ass out. That was murder! Go to your room! Knowing how politically questionable the Chibnall era has been, can you imagine this is a 13th Doctor story? No, because Chibnall's feckless. <laughs> He's like, pathetically... Like, I know he had He's, like, pathetically centrist by accident because he's not good at writing. <laughs> yeah. Like, in fairness, the Chimble era does have Rosa. But yeah, like... yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I imagine this is a 13th Doctor story. Like, the 13th will try and find middle ground. Uh, <laughs> it would just be bad. <laughs> no. Please, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, look, the crystal is gay rights. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I, the thing is, I can see why people would think this story is heavy-handed, but the thing is, real life is heavy-handed. Sometimes, yeah. like this. Uh. Oh. Oh. Well, this is gay. <laughs> <laughs> I am fabulous now. Uh. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa! Oh, you can pass through walls! See, this is what happens when gay rights are <laughs> equal. We become unstoppable. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if Russell T. Davies really likes this story as well. Just like, the, just, just like the last one we watched. God, this is actually tense. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> he got destroyed by the gaze. <laughs> That's another layer to this story, in retrospect. Assume acting command of this space, pending its return to Earth, sir. Hey. Yes. <laughs> it's time to go. <laughs> It's a bit like Tomb of the Cybermen in that regard, because that has dodgy racial undertones, and yet Toberman ends up killing the Cyber Controller. Yeah, and he sacrifices his life to save everyone else. It's like one step back, two steps forward kind of thing. Yeah. More breaking and entering. <laughs> Pertwee's learning from you, making a bad pun, <laughs> except instead of at the start of a video, it's at the end. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> hang on a second. So he was in that room, and he evolved into a mutant, and then he evolved into some, like, gay demigod. <laughs> does That's what the... happens in the summer, don't you know? <laughs> does, it, does this actually make sense? <laughs> Told you it got trippy. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's a nice surprise, but <laughs> I was not expecting that. <laughs> yeah, so apparently, because it's like, it's suggested it's like when they evolve, they turn back into something again, and it's like the natural process, but I wasn't thinking of, if you let these people evolve and stop being a racist, they will float like gods. <laughs> Uh, just, it, just let them be fabulous, Marshall. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, 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 I'm convinced. Um, yes, that was, that was the mutants, which fucking flew by. Um, my initial thoughts on this story: that was really good, like really good story. Like, what? Why the hell is this on the worst of? Because yeah. boomers hate it, that's why. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose. I, on, I'm honestly, I'm puzzled as to what people hate about the story. Um, there's a couple of things that I 
could be critical about. Like like I said, the, the, the climax is a little bit like, oh, that's a bit weird. Um, and obviously, uh, Rick James' character being called Cotton is dodgy. And then obviously, some of the inside of the spaceship looks a bit bland. Um, but apart from that, I thought this was a really solid story. Yeah, I agree. I do not get the hate for this one. The Doctor himself was excellent. John Pertwee was on full barnstorming, for heaven's sake, man, form. Pertwee's always great at the outrage. Yes. And I love the way he, like, sort of figured out what was going on. I mean, obviously that twist in episode four we found out, like, that the mutation is a natural process was excellent. That was a, that was a great twist. And th there's just something so satisfying about the story, the way it all builds up, and then in the last two episodes, everything just unfolds. Like, in episode five, like, all of the people just unload all the evidence onto the marshal, and then in episode six, it, it, his, his entire plan, like, bit by bit, every single pop part of it just starts to crumble. And I love, I love how when the mutant was brought into the ship, he just lost his cool because he's so, you know, he just has so much hatred for them. And he, it, it really exposed him. I really like the way the story's built up. All the layers, like the best thing about the story was all the layers of how it's not just segregation between one race and another. It's that there's like seven or eight different layers of kinds of people involved and they all have a different part to play. It was just so well built up and so well revealed and it's satisfying at the end and it had some really powerful allegory for apartheid and it had a great sci-fi concept around it as well with the planet and the mutation and the direction was great it just oh this was great i really like the story everything on the the planet looked 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 amazing i mean chris barry's direction is always superb but i love the way how he he used film cameras and he integrated all the colors and and it was really it was trippy but it was really it was very gorgeous to look at i think the biggest surprise for me is that the mutants themselves weren't actually villains of the story at all they were very sympathetic i i had i have seen countless people say that this is the worst pertwee story but i thor and they're wrong. thoroughly disagree this is a really good story it's yeah. about important issues it's it's gorgeous visually mm -hmm. Pertwee's just Pertweeing everywhere. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to complain about. Kate, I mean, there are things to complain about. Yeah, there are. There's a few things, but they're 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 not major. And oh, and yeah, Katie Manning unloading on the marshal. Oh, that was amazing. That was just so good. Everything was so satisfying about the story. It was all just delivered so well. Like I thought the story the was reason... I thought the story was gonna have really shit execution, but actually the execution was really good. Apart from the CSO when they're getting sucked yeah. out into space. But other than that. But again, you could you can fix this in post. <laughs> like this is something that on the Blu-ray I, I honestly believe when season nine comes to Blu-ray the mutes is gonna get reappraised if they update the effects. The only reasons why I think anyone could dislike the story are they see a six parter and they're just naturally opposed to six parters because they think they drag. Hmm. Like, that's the only real reason. Or they just don't like politics in Doctor Who. In which case, they're dumb. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you can like Doctor Who for just being a bit of fluff, and that's fine, but I think there is definitely a place for stories like this. Like, this this was captivating for me to watch, especially as someone who knows quite a bit about apartheid. This was a really interesting allegory, and it was different. It was actually, it wasn't just a flat allegory, it wasn't just, if it was a contemporary story and they just went to South Africa and did this story, it would be one thing to do that, but this was so different because it used sci-fi to create a whole world that was similar to apartheid, but it was on like a grand, grandiose scale. It's so weird to me how, what like, this, the kind of stories in Doctor Who that get so much hate always surprise me like there are some where i'm like yeah i agree but a lot of the ones that get a lot of hate i they tend to surprise me and this one definitely doesn't deserve it no Not it doesn't it doesn't it's it's just another one of those ones where people are like oh it's too long and boring and there's bad special effects like uh pertwier is filled with six parters so therefore they all must be bad like that's the kind of logic they approach it with mm -hmm. and it's dumb I dare yeah. say, like, Trout and Pertwee era is the most consistently good period of Who. And it's they are mostly six-parters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Exactly. All the characters are good. All the world building was amazing. The world building was absolutely brilliant. The like shivers I got from seeing people mutate and like the actual mutants themselves made me feel very sympathetic for them. I can imagine if I was, you know, myself right now with the sort of same views I have and I was living in the 70s at the time seeing this story, I would feel quite, you know, inspired by it when apartheid was still a thing. So I hope there were I hope there were some people that liked it when it came out. Probably, yeah. Mm. As I said, just just some kids like it's slow and boring and then they grow up to be yeah. like so like so like, slamming boomers a lot in this video. Yeah, so like like the kid the kids are like, Oh, it's slow and boring and I don't understand that the old people who who are old in the nineteen seventies are like, Oh, this is just attacking me. The kids grow up to be the old people now who are like, I saw it once when it broadcast and it was shit. In terms of historical and reception, this is a generally disliked story for being padded and having bad chroma key. It's considered one of the worst Pertwee stories. And it's undeserved. This is written by Bob Baker and Dave Martin. And again, like, I just, I'm just finding, re-watching their story so far, I'm just like, well, <laughs> they're, they're much better than people give them credit for. Um, although, I haven't seen Underworld, so... There is that. That's interesting, because I think they're very hit and miss, because I don't like Laws of Axos, but I do really like this. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think Hand of Fear is just alright. So I could go back and forth. Yeah. Uh, they do the Three Doctors in Season 10. Mm. And then they do... It's a fun meme. And Season 12, they do some time experiment. They do Invisible, uh, Enemy, Invisible Enemy and Underworld, and uh, Bob Baker does Nightmare of Eden. And I think they may do the Armageddon did... Factor as well. They did, yeah. Yeah, they did a lot of stories. I really appreciated the way this was written. I thought it was really good. You still haven't called that Antonio yet. <laughs> Antonio, hello. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> the story is directed by Christopher Barry, who is one of the best ever. Uh, his direction is absolutely superb. Love it love every I never, bit of direction he does in this show I never even noticed the direction before until you pointed it out and then I'm like holy shit yeah you're right it's, it's so <laughs> it's dynamic this, yeah it's one of those things that's quite because I only really notice direction if it's like really stylish or really flat yeah but like this is this is pretty good and it's very it's, it's a when you actually stop and pay attention to it, it's actually a really dynamic looking story. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, Chris Barry's direction is always great. He's great with rotating the camera. He's great with blocking. He's great with lighting. And anytime they they let him use a film camera, it just he just makes it look like a movie. Like the the scene where the doctor was running through like the fog, or the mist or whatever it is, and people just disappearing through branches. Oh, love that. So good. The music in this is done by Tristram Carey, and he's done music on Chris Barry stories before. He did the music for the Daleks. Yeah, he's an old name. And again, like the music was really cool. <laughs> it was some of it was quite catchy actually. We were like sort of bopping along to it. Was, it. Yeah, it was a bit ploddy, but like in a fun way. <laughs> like burp, 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 burp. Mm. Yeah, it was. But I did like it. Uh, so shall we move on to some trivia? Okay. So, the story had the working titles of The Independence and The Emergence, and like you said, I believe it was also called The Mutant as well, though Barry Litz uh, submitted it for a trout. Actually, trying to think about it, what, what would this have, how dif different would this story have been if it was a trout? Just thinking about it. Um, all it says is that it would have been about a similar concept of a race metamorphosizing. Mm. It may have been a little bit less political. Maybe a bit more sci-fi. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Like, like it, it, instead of like, for heaven's sake, man, have, have some, um, have some. Do you have it in your heart to see that these are people? Rather, it, it would be more like, oh, Jamie mutants. <laughs> and then later on, he'd be like, actually, Jamie, these are people. Why? This one's a lasser. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh no. I can imagine Victoria looking at Beauty and going, Oh no, Doctor! It's awful! <laughs> episode 6 of this story was the last time that the middle 8 was used until what, the final 4 episodes of The Invasion of Time. Episode 6 of this story is also the first time in the history of the series to bear an on-screen copyright date. Joe is the only female character to appear in this story. Well, you don't know what the 
mutants are. They could be. They could be female. That's kind of a problem with seventy two in general. Like it kind of especially um, women are things. Especially sometimes. the Henchcliffe era. <laughs> yeah. Eesh. I'm pretty sure aren't like Sarah Jane and Leela the only female characters in the Henchcliffe era. <laughs> could be wrong on that. Oh, the Sisterhood of Khan. Oh yeah, Sisterhood like, of Khan. Know. Yeah. Are there any female Time Lords in the Deadly Assassin? No. No. Oh dear. I think there's like a, an automated voice that um, Barusa gets to read out for him at one point, mm. like OTT capsules or something. But that's it. That's all the women in the Deadly Assassin. Oh dear. <laughs> what about the Mask of Andraga? Is that all male as well? I believe so. uh, there's the ball, but like in terms of relevant talking, main speaking characters, yeah. Uh, Bob Baker felt that it was best that he and Dave Martin wrote, although Martin admitted that the execution wasn't the best. I disagree. I think they did really well. Yeah, it's the same with the Crotons. Like they felt like they all fucked up. It's like no, you guys did good. <laughs> A subplot about cloning was removed from the latter portion of the adventure as it felt to be overly complex. Well, I'm happy because I think cloning is a really overdone thing in Doctor Who, and I hate it when it's done wrong. Like, I fucking yeah. despise the rebel flesh. Like, Jesus Christ! That, that, that's the worst example of when cloning's done bad. I, I have a very, I have a bone to pick with like, it's like a pet peeve of mine. It's when cloning's done well, it's good, and when cloning's done bad, it makes me angry. Colin Baker was considered for the role of Cotton. Interesting. I don't know how that would have worked, considering. The... <laughs> mm. the bad blood between John Pertwee and Chris Barry, which had started when the two worked together on the Demons, didn't improve any during the production of this story and resulted in Barry not working again on the series until Pertwee left and was replaced by Tom Baker. Yeah. Production assistant Fiona Cumming became unwell and fell asleep in her room without placing the unit's cash on hand in the hotel's vault. This proved serendipitous as coming work, work the next morning discovered that the hotel porter and had looted the vault and disappeared. The Chislehurst shoot co coincided with the onset of industrial action across Britain, which caused sporadic power outages. Chris Barry's team was caught in one of the blackouts, forcing them to navigate the Chisel Caves in the pitch dark. Okay, so give your conclusion and rating out of 10 for the mutants. Pretty good story. I admit I'm not that knowledgeable about Apartheid. So you're you're the expert, um, but it's still a really great story, like in even in its own context. Honestly, like it's great. So when the marshal gets his come up and it's like that build up, that build up, that build up, that build up, mm. and then it all comes crashing down on top of him, and yeah, it's great. Um, mutants are an interesting species with a great, like fascinating life cycle, and the story gets trippy at points. And it's just always it's always just great to have the third Doctor and Joe in an off-world scenario and just basking in the atmosphere and stuff. <laughs> my my commentary sounds a lot more like brainless and undignified compared to yours, but... <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's good. <laughs> um, I would give it... I don't really do like 0.5s or anything, because like, that just gets a bit too convoluted for me, but I'd give it like a 7 or an 8, honestly. I'm going to count that as a 7.5. Okay, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> Alright, The Mutants is, from what I can understand, uh, disliked, and for that I can say it is criminally underrated. The Apartheid allegory is excellently handled across a very complex plot that builds up and unfolds in a very satisfying way. Uh, especially also in the second half with the big plot twist was brilliant, I love that twist. The direction by Chris Barry was excellent. The characters were all well done, uh, especially the leads, and there were some really trippy visuals. And I was, again, I mean, I, I can't, to be honest, I can't actually say pleasantly surprised, because I had a funny feeling I'd like this one anyway. But I suppose I can say pleasantly surprised um, to the fact that I really liked this one. It's, out of the ones we've seen so far in the Worcester Classic Who series, it's probably my second favourite behind Colony in Space. And I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. Hmm. Damn. Close. Mm. I do prefer it to Colony in Space, honestly. I think this has more... It's more interesting, but Colony in Space is definitely still great. Because it's Roger Delgado and stuff. 
<laughs> yeah, well, Colony in Space is a lovely, lovely story for me. I love it. Love that one. So, yeah, that was The Mutants, and now it's time for us to defend an episode against Hellbent. I've chosen one that we both like, that is very disliked. Yep. And that is The Lazarus Experiment. It's a good monster runaround that people just bitch slap way too much because of dodgy CGI, and that's unfair. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, the CGI is dodgy, but, like, it's Doctor Who. It's never going to look good. Like, come on. (laughs) Yeah, like, the CGI of Doctor Who hasn't been great until, like, the last five years or so. Even then, well, to be fair, 2014 wasn't the last five years, but the Cybermen and Death in Heaven looked terrible. The flying Cybermen. Um, but, you know, Les Experiment, like like you say, like it has dodgy CGI, and that's not the best. But apart from that, um, it's a story with Mark Gatiss being hammy, which is great. It's got a really interesting concept about aging, and it's all linking into the finale as the master caused it to happen. Uh, you have a great scene with David Tennant giving a morality about just because you live longer doesn't mean it's good. Um, and that ties into his character arc about him feeling like he maybe have lived too long as a Time Lord, especially now that he's the last. It also gives Martha's... Yeah, the it also, it's also the, the episode of Series 3, outside of maybe the finale, that give Martha's family the most to do. It's, it's a story that's a great commentary on just the concept of life mm. and aging and, you know... Mm-hmm. Um, it's also quite a classy outlier for the Tenant era because, you know, Tenant era is like this very wonderfully chaotic thing. But this is more more of a classy, sophisticated story because, you know, he's in a tux and they attend mm-hmm. like a, a high profile scientific experiment. And it's quite poetry ish in a way, mm-hmm. but like, not really. Um, got some great material for Ten and Martha. Yes. And Tish. And obviously Tish this is, is um <laughs> this is this is the middle section of series three, so this is when like Ten and Martha are mostly getting along really well, so they're really fun to watch. Especially the scene where they're like trying to break down what the hell's going on and they both have a bit of a a bit of a a, a, a braid off, I suppose you could say, like they're both being very smart together. I love that scene. Um And it's also the one where like the Tenth Doctor wants to stay by his word and says, Oh, I said I'd take you on the, this trip and this trip, but I think it's time I go now. But then by the end, he's like, Oh, just come along. You know? I love that. He's just suddenly realised, Actually, I really like having Martha around. Um, and then, of course, you get Human Age Family Blood in a two, two stories time, which starts to, you know, whiplash that. But, yeah, I think there's some really good character work in there. There's some really good dialogue. Mark Gatiss is hilarious i love the bit where he's he when he's old and he um he talks to tish and he's like that's an interesting perfume <laughs> she's like it's soap yeah <laughs> yeah um and like yeah the, mo- the great... monster the monster looks shit but like you know yeah there's some great body horror to make up for that though like the oh yeah dried up husks mm. And there's some just funny dialogue all around. Like, I just love choking on an olive lady. Like, she is. <laughs> <laughs> and even though the CGI is not the best, I like some of the direction around the Lazarus Monster, especially when it's running down that corridor and it goes like along the roof like a circle. Like a spiral, almost. That's a cool shot. Oh, yeah. Um, and I also love the fact that the plot is resolved by the Doctor playing a church organ. Yeah, it's yeah. it's quite novel actually. Also because it's, it's kind of a also because it's in a church that ties into the theme of series three about uh, religion as well. The themes. It's kind of a pseudo. It's kind of a pseudo sequel to Tooth and Claw in a way because you know they're both a monster run around episode in a classy setting. That's their only similarity, but you know. Except, <laughs> you know what I mean. Except I doubt you'd want to sleep with the Lazarus monster. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> Well, superiority. Yeah. It, it does. It does look like a PS2 character, doesn't? Doesn't it? Well, even PS1. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Oh, Gator's JPEG face. But yes, no. The Lazarus Experiment is a fun run around. It's not the best episode ever, but there's some really interesting character drama in it. Uh, some of the Saxon group stuff is really good too. Um, if a little bit pantoesque, but I I find it enjoyable. Like a bit where the bit where the guys are whispering in Francine's ear. 
He's like, this man yeah. is dangerous. Ooh. <laughs> um, there's there's things you could have done to make it like a bit better. Like if it was a um, if it was like a two part story where you factored in a lot more of the Saxon group stuff and you made it more political, you could have you could have amped up the story to another level. But it's still, I think, I still think it's good. I still think it's a good episode. Much better than people say it is. I think it gets ro- uh, like bashed for its CGI. Um, and also because the rest of series three is just so much better, apart from maybe forty two, uh, I think it just doesn't look as good by comparison. But on the grand scheme of things, I still think the last experiment is a fair success, as opposed to Hellbent, which, in my opinion, is not in the slightest. Yeah, like Lazarus Experiment Hellbent's actually, just... Lazarus Experiment for me is actually entertaining to watch, whereas Hellbent makes me want to rip my hair out. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna sound like a basic bitch, but like, Tell Ben is two characters I don't give a fuck about <laughs> expositing how much they love each other as they've been doing for the last two fucking seasons. Mm-hmm. The the character Lazarus experiment is the character drama <laughs> with the around. the character drama with the com- doctor and companion and Lazarus experiment comparatively is better written in my opinion. It's better handled. Uh, the speeches especially the speeches that the doctor gives in the last experiment are so much better and so much more profound and so much more like they make more sense than the ones in hellbent like more the poignant yeah, yeah like the ones in the last experiment actually fit really well with that doctor's character arc at that point in time whereas in hellbent it's all very forced and just so pretentious the only thing I would get he- give help in over Lazarus Experiment is probably like stylistic things like the visuals. Like Rachel Talele's direction is much better than Lazarus Experiments, whatever that is. But still, you know, that's a that, that's an that's an aesthetic thing. What if, like, in the middle of Hellbent, the Lazarus monster just came crashing through the capital? <laughs> that would make it a ten out of ten. It would. It would. <laughs> Like, he's just saved Clara, and then she gets squashed by Mark Gatiss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was an experiment, good. Hellbent, bad. End of story. Yeah. Yeah. Yay. I can't give any more intelligent answers. I just agree. <laughs> yep. Um, so, that means that the next time on this series, I'm going to be doing the Time Monster, which is most likely going to be with Mason... If it's not with Mason, it'll be you with you, and if it's not with you, then it'll probably be with Matt. So I got three options. Why not all three? <laughs> no, that'd be too crowded. <laughs> no, I, I like this being a one-on-one. It's much easier, and also I want to focus on the fucking story. I don't want people talking in my ear. Like, just imagine watching an episode of Doctor Who, and you've got like Oliver Bennett and Strange Folk just constantly talking. <laughs> <laughs> like Oliver Bennett's just like, but what if the mutants weren't mutants, eh? And then fucking strange was like Peter Davison sucks, David Tennant sucks, Matt Smith sucks. Also, can we talk about how Jenny Sin is the worst thing to ever happen to mankind? <laughs> yep, that's a strange. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, anything else you want to say before we end the video? Uh, I'll be back soon, I guess. I don't know when. Sometime in the future, maybe like multiple videos. Who knows? Yes, mutants good. Uh, I'm looking forward to the time monster. Bye bye.